guys, today at our Thrifty Cottage, we're gonna learn how to make authentic sauerkraut. Now, my recipe has been a recipe that I've got from my mom, so there aren't any exact measurements, but I promise at the end of the video, I will actually find a recipe that's really close to what I do, and uh, I'll add it to the um, comment section, I guess, so you guys get a chance to see, um, I guess, a printed recipe of how to make sauerkraut. So, sauerkraut is not complicated at all, what we need is some cabbage, of course. For my recipe, we need some salt and we need a little bit of sugar in there. We also need a really great container that is sealable. We've got this awesome little croc style uh, container that we got at a really cool secondhand store. But what we've also used as well is one of these one gallon jars. Sauerkraut works in there as well. People have made them in regular sealer jars as well. So um, I guess we'll get started. So what we're gonna need today, of course, is our salt, our sugar, and two medium heads of cabbage. As you see, I've already chopped one of those beautiful bad boys up, and uh, we'll get going. Now I'm gonna bring my lovely assistant in here, Tony, <laughs> to come help me out. Um, I have a hard time with punching the cabbage down because when you make sauerkraut, you have to make sure there's a way to tamp it down into your container so you get all the wonderful juices and such from the cabbage into your mixture. Uh, so it can actually start to ferment and have that natural brine going. So what Tony does for me is we load the cabbage into the container, he punches it, I add my salt, add my sugar, he punches it, we have another layer of cabbage, and that's what we do. But also people use tampers, and something like this would work very well. This is a, is it called an Italian rolling pin? French rolling, rolling pin? Yeah, something like that. Something like that, but you can also buy uh, wooden tampers for working inside sealer jars as well for tamping it down. Just be careful when you're doing it, you're not smashing it, because you'll break your jar or break your container. So. Let's get rock and rolling there, Tony. In case you don't have a Tony. <laughs> uh, I'm strong enough to do the punching down myself, but with my Lyme disease, it's really hard on my hands. So Tony is my gracious volunteer. So I've already chopped up one of the heads of cabbage. What you want to do is you want to chop it up really, really fine. Hopefully you guys can see this. We'll zoom in afterwards. Chop it up really small. So it's kind of like coleslaw sizes. Um, some people use a mandolin to do this. I don't. It's too dangerous for me because... Those things are painful. Only if you put your finger in the blade. Yeah, they hurt. So some people have an actual cabbage shredder or cabbage cutter that they use if they're making a really large batch of it. I just use my knife and chop it up really small. Okay. Well, then you're going to load? Yeah. You're a good loader. So something else that I always recommend too is save a couple of the bigger leaves of your cabbage because we're going to put that on top of the sauerkraut when we're finished with it to help hold everything down so it can ferment nicely without getting... Uh, any extra things into it, I guess. So yeah, you want to keep your um, anything that you ever ferment. You want to keep it below the liquid. Oxygen in contact with the thing that you're fermenting is going to create mold. It's not unusual when you're fermenting things with wild ferments to get some white film on top. That's called cam yeast. K H A M K A H M yeast. Mm -hmm. Good spelling. Yeah, that's not unusual, <laughs> no problem. Green fuzzy mold, not good. You don't not want good. that. Not good. You don't want that. So, oh, you're gonna do the. the well, uh, just to pre salt I'll start. let you do it. Okay, what we're gonna start with is I'm gonna take a regular old tablespoon, but I guess you can measure it yourself if you want. I'm gonna put it in the bottom of my jar. I'm gonna start, we're gonna start with tablespoon first of all. Okay. And you're gonna start loading that. I'll just pop it over here. Yeah. Okay. You're gonna start loading that cabbage in there. Put a little bit more, we'll put another tablespoon of salt in. Not really punching right now because there's not very much in there, but um, when you first begin, uh, because I do most of the punching work, I get the texture feel here. <clears throat> if you put a little bit of, just a little bit of salt and leave it sit for a few minutes, five, 10 minutes, less than that because we're gonna do here, the salt will start to bring the moisture out of the cabbage. Unlike a lot of other ferments that we do, which we'll show you some of those as we go along mm -hmm. as well. Um, what do you call that one? Garden, garden, garden? The garden gorgon one. <laughs> garden era. Um, garden era. Where you actually create a liquid brine. The cabbage doesn't have liquid in it, so that it act, kind of self brines, I guess. That's the best That's way That's the best to way to put it, it, I think. So, okay, I'm gonna add another tablespoon. Tony, put a couple more handfuls. That's another tablespoon of salt. So, so no, far, that's so two tablespoons. We use a coarse salt because we use coarse salt for everything, actually. It's not like the crazy coarse pickling salt, but kind of that between that fine grain and the pickling grain, I guess, is what we use. Now, um, if you pay attention to 
um, any of the fermenting recipes, they'll say to use non-iodized salt. But like Vanessa, did your mom ever have non-iodized salt? You know, I don't know. Salt? It was it was just salt. We use, this is non-iodized salt because that's typically what we buy now, is it not? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So. Would she have used pickling salt or table salt? Tony, you're asking me to go back like 45 years. Oh come on. I don't know. Salt. <laughs> I'm gonna guess it was table salt she would have used. I think it, mind you, it was coarse. It really hurt my knuckles when I was punching it. We'll have to ask that question. We'll have to ask, we'll have to ask the magical mom that question. Mm -hmm. So tell the stories of what it was like when you were, what do you um, remember from when you so were when we used your to make, mom or your grandma? When we used to make um, sauerkraut, my mom has, she still has it, she still makes sauerkraut with it. She's got this massive crock. And it's, so it probably stands about that high. It's massive. And it's got a big um, ceramic lid that goes on top of it as well. And it's old. It's, it's an old crop. But I remember doing, my gosh, I don't I even know how many heads of cabbage went into that crop. Because my mom grew a rather large garden. And uh, we actually used a cabbage cutter, right, to cut the cabbage. It would not have been by hand because that would have taken forever. And punching and punching and punching. And it was like, it wasn't like a quick 20 minute procedure. This was like a two hour procedure trying to get all this sauerkraut going and punching. And then she would um, place, a, I think I believe it was a cloth on top. And then, I think it was a cloth. You know, I don't even remember that, but she had this, she had her sauerkraut rock, which was like the rock of ages, I swear to God. <laughs> and she put it on top of that, and then she put the lid on top of her sauerkraut. And she put it in a cold storage room, and she would check it uh, every few days to start out with. And then a week later, and it's how it got to the perfect run, the, the perfect amount of sour sauerkrautness. And it was amazing, it's a fantastic memory. And I remember we enjoyed freezer bags of, my mom froze the bags of sauerkraut then, and uh, freezer bags of salt all through the fall and winter, and it was spooktacular. So just started, and only one little handful, but... So you gotta already see the juice coming out of that cabbage. Some cabbage is not as juicy as others, of course, depends on what kind of cabbage you use. It could just depend on the year of the cabbage. Some is sweeter than others. Um, so yeah, so this is why I, we kind of do it by taste and feel. That's how I grew up. So. And then, so how do you cook? I cook with emotion. So <laughs> I do, I cook with emotion. So as, as we're cooking, we, we are making our sauerkraut or whatever it is, we keep tasting it every once in a while to find out if it's got that, you know, spark that we're looking for in that moment. So Tony's going to put the rest of this cabbage in there, I'm guessing, right? Sure. And I'm going to throw in a tablespoon of sugar. Now this is my mom's secret recipe, the recipe that was handed down to her. And, uh. We have a little bit of sugar in our recipe. And it makes it so yummy. It doesn't make it sweet at all. It just gives it that right amount of tanginess. How long, um, when, you're, when your grandma or your great grandma made sauerkraut in their basement, mm -hmm. did they ever put it in a fridge or freezer? No, they left it in the basement. And it, end, it will end up, um, it will continue to ferment. And if it got too sour, then they'd wash it. Right, so fermentation is such an amazing thing. It's been around for thousands of years. I mean, making wine is fermentation. So it's such an amazing practice to be able to carry on. And I think this is a really great thing for future generations to learn as well still. And when do you eat sauerkraut? Oh, for me, I have to have sauerkraut every single morning. Okay. Well, because I, I also have, um, I'm kind of gluten intolerant. I have some issues with the old body stuff. Anyway. <laughs> So in the morning, I have probably two heaping tablespoons of sauerkraut for breakfast, and then have my breakfast after that. Every single day, it's a wonderful prebiotic. It helps with the probiotics, keeps everything functioning the way it should, and it's so good for you. Sauerkraut and kimchi are amazing, amazing for your health and your body and your gut health. So mm -hmm. I'm really pumping up this sauerkraut, see? Right? You should. So you should. we're going to... Uh, continue with this, but we don't need to bring you along for the rest of the ride. We'll we'll bring you in so you can kind of see what's going on up close and personal, and then we'll bring you in at the end, and you'll see some of the updates as we go along. We'll see updates as we go along. This is Tony punching the cabbage down. You see, it's getting smooshy already. You want to show them some of the juice? Isn't that great? So, to save your hand. I'll kind of alternate, when I first put it in, I'll just kind of start running it through my hand and crushing it as much as I can. And I'll just keep doing that. And then this particular crock has swirls in the bottom. So I actually, when I punch, I rock my hand back and forth instead of just punching straight down. So I'm kind of 
working my knuckles against it, it seems to get the juices out a little faster than just straight. It doesn't splash either. You can put liquid you have in there already. Yeah, you don't need to add liquid. All you need to do is have, I don't know if you'll see this, but I just kind of started. You just need to have the liquid over top of, can you see that when it drips? Yep. You need to have the liquid above the cabbage, that's all. And the cabbage has enough juice in it to ferment itself. You don't need to add any more. It's a miracle of salt that mm -hmm. pulls out that liquid. Okay, one thing I want to point out, guys, when you're chopping up your cabbage, you want to get this core out. You see that big, thick core? This is from the other cabbage. The big, thick core, you want to get that out of there because you do not want that in your sauerkraut because it's going to be way too hard. And I would probably get rid of the really big veins as well that are really hard. So you don't want those guys in there. So Tony is finished punching down the cabbage. Um, you can hear our little Reggie dog outside. She wants to come inside. You can see the liquid in there. Tony, you can get a shot of that. That way, <laughs> you can see in there, are lots of liquids coming out of that cabbage, which is what you want, of course. Now, this is how I do it. I cook by emotion. So as we're doing the cabbage, as Tony's punching down the cabbage and chopping it up, I and I'm adding the salt and the sugar to it. I test it every so often, every couple layers of the cabbage to see what the flavor is like, because I really believe to cook to understand your food is you need to have a bit, put a little bit of emotion into it. Or taste. And, and taste into it? <laughs> I don't know where he's going with that. But as you taste it, <laughs> as you're going along, then you know what it is. You're becoming part of that food. Is it too salty? Is it too sweet? Is it the flavor that you want? Is it that flavor you had, you know, remembered that your, when your grandma had made whatever that food is, right? So I taste it as I go along. I don't use very many recipes. When I do, usually I tweak them. So any recipe that I share on uh, the videos or on our website, our thriftycottage.com, it's a recipe I've already tweaked and I've made it Vanessa style because I've done it through emotion. So I'm going to taste this stuff now. Sorry. Perfect. So this is what I'm tasting. Neutral. I taste neutral. Some cabbages are sweeter. Some are flatter. That's just the way it is. So as you're adding your sugar and your salt to it, add little amounts at a time so you can taste it. And when I say it tastes neutral, I can't taste too much sugar and I can't taste too much salt. I just taste the foundations of a really fabulous sauerkraut. That's where we're at right now. So we're gonna clean up the outside, outside of the inside to make sure it's tidied up. We don't have too many stragglers that aren't underneath our little sauerkraut cabbage cover. And we'll cover it, we'll show you guys how we do that. And uh, we're gonna let it sit and ferment right after that. So be back in a sec. We've tidied up the inside of our little crock that we have here to make sure we don't have any stragglers. The reason we do that is we don't wanna cause unnecessary mold. Um, for something that's not been submerged underneath the sauerkraut juices. Now I'm going to take those leaves that I took off the cabbage originally. I'm going to place them right on top. This is going to cause a little, or create, I guess, a little bit of a barrier. There we go. And I have these fantastic glass weights that we got from Amazon. They're so cool. They're uh, they're called canning weights, I think they're they? They're called. Yeah, they're just a canning weight. And they're going to go on top. They're going to hold everything down. Now, if you don't have these weights, you can also take a Ziploc bag. Make sure it's one that doesn't have holes in it. Fill it with water and set it inside. It's going to hold everything down as well. So now we're going to let this beautiful sauerkraut sit covered. I will peek at it tomorrow to see if we have any fermentation yet. But I'm going to guess by around down day three, we're going to see some little bubbly bubs in there and it'll start to smell funky, which is what we love. So this is day three of the sauerkraut and I just tasted it and it's starting to get sour. This is what it's looking like so far. You see those little bubbles happening there. That means a fermentation process is starting. Pretty cool. So it's been 10 days since we started our little sauerkraut here. And I'm gonna lift the bag up so you guys take a look at it. Um, I noticed that the cabbage leaves weren't giving me a really great seal. And I wanna make sure I have a really great seal because I don't want any funkiness happening to my sauerkraut, any green molds, anything like that. So I actually took the leaves out and replaced them with this Ziploc bag. It's about half full of water. It gives you just a great seal. As you can see, it's sealed all the way around inside of my crock. Just lift that bag out. 
Oh my gosh, I can already smell the sauerkraut. Put that aside. Now you'll see that the color of the sauerkraut has changed from that green color to more of a golden, translucent almost. It's so wonderful. I can smell it's delicious already. I'll do a taste test when I'm done, but I know I can already just put in the smell tell you that it's the perfect sauerkraut happening right there. And isn't it really neat how we can do this ourselves with stuff that we have on our farm or if you're watching for sales in grocery stores, cabbage will be going on sale really soon. Cabbage is such a versatile vegetable. Of course, you can use it for making fermentation like sauerkraut. You can use it for stir fries. You can use it for salads. Uh, there's just so many things, soups, stews. There's so many things you can do with cabbage. It's a, kind of like that vegetable that'll give, 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 give. So healthy, of course, full of lots of vitamins, iron, um, just an amazing little vegetable. So anyway, this is our sauerkraut video. It is finished. It smells delicious. My next step will be to actually scoop it out of here. I'm going to put it into some sealer jars that have been cleaned and uh, seal up my sauerkraut. I'm going to make sure I have all that juice in my jars as well, though, because it's going to protect my sauerkraut and keep it, you know, just really great for a longer time in the refrigerator. Um, some people will freeze it. I don't make that big of a batch at a time, so I'm going to throw it in my sealer jars and put it in my fridge and have it for breakfast every single morning because you want good gut health. That's our sauerkraut video, guys. Thanks.